Okay, great. Let's let's start it. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, very excited by this panel uh, where we'll discuss about utilizing advanced ML technique. Um, I have with me just four very, very uh, knowledgeable professionals <laughs> around, the, around these panels uh, that will introduce themselves. Um, so I will let uh, everyone just um, discuss and present just each, um, each, uh, each of them. But um, this panel will be just kind of a deep dive on uh, machine learning, a lot of trend elements, a lot of use in uh, investment uh, for many, many different reasons. Just we have a lot of different people that try just to use machine learning, different set of models. But uh, I think that from this group of people that we have on the panel, uh, they will express why it's not about just using some prepackaged models, uh, why it is important to uh, go and personalize your model, just uh, kind of fine tune your models, uh, just to make sure that you find the best of uh, machine learning and AI techniques. So uh, welcome everyone. I will let uh, my uh, four different uh, co-presenters on this panel uh, just introduce themselves. Uh, I don't know who wants to start, uh, Alexandra. Hi, uh, hello everyone. Uh, well, uh, I'm uh, Alejandra Literio, and uh, I work at iCapital. Uh, I'm a forensic linguist and the head of the research and development department. Um, my field of work is natural language processing and um, leading the, uh, an innovative group of uh, people that is working with me uh, where what I call the MetaQuant approach. I also started my, my um, let's say, road in uh, quantum natural language processing. Uh, so I also coordinated the, the quantum lab in, in um, iCapital uh, is a newly born, well, I say that because it's, it, it was born four years ago. Um, it's a FinTech that uh, designs and develops our algorithms based on artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, and natural language processing. And basically what we, uh, as I mentioned, what we have is uh, services such as the Quantum Lab in order to get these in innovative um, approaches into the mainstream. And we also have this approach that is Quantum as a Service, um, using machine learning techniques to optimize uh, the uh, customer data. And I will explain that later on, so I don't um, uh, be uh, much longer talking. To say that we also uh, have this internship uh, program since I'm a teacher myself because I work uh, in the academic field also. So, uh, and as a researcher as, as well, interacting with uh, the university and the researcher centers here in Buenos Aires. Great, thanks a lot, Alexandra. Just uh, Stuart. Um... Sure, thank you. Uh, so I'll introduce myself. My name is Stuart Cazola. I'm our head of products and strategy here at the MathWorks, uh, particularly for the financial services industry. So for those of you who are not familiar what company the MathWorks is, it's this is the MATLAB company. Most people know us by our product, uh, MATLAB, more than they do by the actual company name itself. I've been serving kind of in this role for the past seven years. Before that, I was managing products for statistics optimization. Um, you could call those probably our data science products today. Back then, they weren't called data science products, but they are today because that's where most of the techniques are being used. Um, my career kind of spans kind of the historical engineer to quant kind of role. You know, 15 years ago, I was spending time doing actual rocket and combustion system design for Pratt & Whitney. So I did a lot of design around military spacecraft, some of the rocket booster engines uh, that, that Pratt & Whitney owned at the time, as well as commercial vehicles. So. I started up my career as an engineer and then moved into kind of business and finance and then into the MathWorks where I've been managing the area and interacting with our customers over a long time period, looking at building a lot of technology systems and infrastructure for doing everything from, you know, pricing insurance uh, contracts to, you know, out, full algorithmic trading systems. So that's kind of my background in, a, in, in history in a, in a nutshell. So I'm looking forward to the conversation today and glad to be here. I've been with the AI and data science and trading group. I think this is our third year participating. So we've, we've been around for a while. Thanks a lot, Stuart. Thanks a lot. Simon? 
Hey everyone, I'm Simon Chow. I work at Fidelity Investments. I am the head of emerging tech. I've been with the firm for about 17 years. Like Stuart, I started as an engineer, um, but then I transitioned to architecture. I've been a product manager, and now I'm in my current role where I lead a global team of data scientists and full stack engineers to help our investment professionals and support organizations solve problems through AI and machine learning. Our primary goals are to increase alpha, improve productivity, and reduce operational risk. Happy to be here. Fantastic. Thank you, Simon. Alex? Thank you. Excited to be here. My name is uh, Alex Siplikin. I'm a senior AI engineer at GraphCore. GraphCore has built a chip for machine learning. Uh, we call it IPU, Intelligence Processing Unit. So IPU accelerates both training and inference by, say, 15 times for some modern models in finance. At GraphCore, I'm focused on machine learning use cases in finance and I'm helping drive customer success. Before GraphCore, I worked in machine learning consulting. And before that, I was in academia. My PhD is in speech biometrics. Thanks a lot, Alex. But welcome, everyone. Um, so that's, let, let's jump into it, so that we have uh, machine learning AI uh, that's become more and more popular, but that's just, so I don't know, Simon, Alex, can you just, one of you just start and just explain us why that seem to have a lot of different techniques in, uh, in, uh, in investment. Why do we have this surge in terms of using AI and machine learning today? Sure, I'll, I'll go ahead and kick off. Um, first, I want to say that this, this phenomenon isn't isolated to finance. I think it's sort of, uh, you know, kind of spreading around all industries. But um, I can think of a few reasons. So essentially data, infrastructure, and algorithms. So within finance, let's start there. Um, I mean, it's an ultra competitive industry. We'll do anything to gain an edge. Um, traditional market data is a commodity these days. There's not much of a differentiator. There's highly efficient markets for the most part, um, but data. So the, there's a huge proliferation of data. Um, there've been papers published by IBM, et cetera, that indicate that 90% of the world's data was created in the past two years. That stat is a little bit stale, but I think it's, it's still largely true, um, primarily unstructured data, but also semi-structured and, and, uh, and structured. Um, so all this new data is, is coming around to infrastructure, right? So at low cost and accessible to everyone anywhere. So if you think about the incredible increase in compute power, well, back in the 60s, all of NASA, um, that could fit on a fraction of the compute power of an iPhone 6. In fact, an iPhone 6 can perform about 120 million times faster than NASA computers. An iPhone 12, which is the most current model, is about five to 10 faster than that. Um, also faster network speeds and lower latency, cheaper and ubiquitous storage. Um, so all of these things kind of come together to enable the, the, the advance of AI and, and algorithms, funnily enough, they've been around for decades there's been some minor improvements, some breakthroughs, but largely it's, it's the massive growth and digitization of data and the increased potency of the infrastructure. Thanks, is that um, Gerard? So Alex, Alexandra, is that any other view is that from, uh, from your point, uh, from your angle, from your experience about why you see that kind of ML and AI just that jumping in? I would second, uh, Simon, those were the enabling factors, uh, the availability of the data and the infrastructure and the algorithms. The algorithms um, appear to be a bit older than the uh, availability of the data. Um, I think the value that drives um, the adoption of AI is uh, in the automation overall, not only in finance, but in other industries as well, automation. And uh, in finance, I think uh, most of the adoption is in the area of uh, alternative data currently, NLP for sentiment analysis or transcript processing, and then computer vision for things like satellite images to try and estimate uh, the alpha using some unique data sets that are uh, less of a commodity now. And so uh, yep. Sorry, so so when we go to that in more in more detail on the on those type of models, and um, Alex, you are just free, feel free just to jump in. Is that uh, when we look at the different trends? So you were mentioning that different set of models just on on NLP, for example. What are the trends of the models that we see today in terms of that are really working? When we look not necessarily that in terms of 
aeronautics, but in investment management, where do we see that kind of the model that become more and more popular or the ones that are just start to raise? Sure, I can I can give some perspectives I see from the clients that we serve um, in terms of the models. But you know, I think I think a lot of it is if you look at the modeling kind of history, it's gone from regression. You know, the Federal Reserve has had models of you know 100 different regression models modeling the U.S. economy. Uh, that you could think of that as kind of machine learning today, but those were all developed and, and kind of managed by people. Today, we're using machines to kind of figure out the representation of those equations, and and you know we're feeding it data. And we're feeding it, um, you know, we're feeding it data and outcomes and training it to predict a program now where in the past we used to kind of give it a program and, and, and train it and use the data to predict the outcome. So we're kind of doing it backwards and using the machines to do that. And that's, that's kind of the difference here and where we're seeing, you know, in finance where the models are being most efficient, like decision trees are very deep decision trees. Um, those are highly effective uh, in finance and you can find them anywhere from pricing uh, an insurance contract to, you know, credit scoring and things like that. That's, that seems to be one of the dominant models I see kind of throughout the financial services industry is tree models because um, they tend to perform quite well and they're fairly transparent when you look at them. Uh, when we look at kind of the deep learning area where I'm seeing most of those applications come out are not necessarily the traditional kind of modeling approaches, but um, unlocking new new sources of data or the structured data that's out there. I think IDC reported that, you know, 80% of the world's information is locked up in, in, in unstructured data. So if you think of all the textual data that's out there, that is now being unlocked by the ability of machine learning to mine it for information. Um, being able to do sentiment scoring, text summarization, a variety of things like that. So I think that's kind of the big key area where I'm seeing more and more of the, this, this deep learning uh, applications is in that space versus some of the traditional uh, methods that you know economists and statisticians used to do you're seeing bigger and bushier trees kind of being used, but they're still, in a way, I think of them as traditional methods are just larger than they used to be. Okay, and, and, and for example, that's, so, that, that's completely true. And just NLP just, that is used just a lot in terms of instructional data, just to try just to interpret everything. Just Alexandra, this is one of your kind of key forte, uh, mm -hmm. I presume as well. So do you, do you have any view on just on those kind of Models or just new new type of uh, models that are coming up at the moment. Well, uh, yes. In in close up, there is a strong tendency uh, to study uh, models that provide more information that are like more descriptive rather than predictive. For instance, uh, I, I'm. I'm referring to uh, more precisely to explainable models that are a good example of um, aiding analysts and investors to understand what is happening in the market, where to invest, position, uh, what are the market drivers, um, beyond having a model uh, telling you uh, if XX company shares are going up or down uh, tomorrow, for instance. And in as, as, as you mentioned, natural language processing, well, it is always evolving, providing new tools and approaches. And as we all know, nat natural language processing draws on uh, machine learning and human generated linguistic rules to fill up the gas between uh, human communication and machine understandings. And one example of that is BERT. Uh, which was a milestone towards democratizing uh, uh, NLP models, allowing a, a wide range of applications using a pre-trained language model and fine-tuning them for a specific task such as question and answering, name and classification. Um, um, for finance, uh, they, uh, they have developed what is called FinBird, that is a, a bird a uh, base language model with deeper understanding of financial uh, language. Of course, uh, as any approach, it has its advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is that you do not need a huge data set for fine tuning uh, because the model learns about language during the original language model training. Nevertheless, as with uh, most deep learning models, it is not very easy to intuit on the failure of a model of uh, Finbird, uh, mainly when you are talking about a, uh, an objective observation or uh, let's say an objective tweet. And there are some other developments that might might be uh, you might be that came after Bird, such as Roberta, Doc Bird, Distilled Bird, Albert, and Beto, which is uh, the Spanish version of, of Bird. Uh, but well, uh, that's that deserves another 
I think, panel because it's too long to explain. Uh, but there are, certainly there have been many uh, advances and, 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 and many uh, different tools. Um, nowadays, so that, uh, well, Alex and, and, and Simon mentioned alternative data and Stuart mentioned, I, I think, uh, them as well. So you have a variety of text that you need to analyze, reports, earning calls, and, and, and well, uh, that will be uh, very useful if you can. Anyway, uh, what I'm always uh, telling my, my, the, the customers when I'm, I'm talking that uh, it is good to uh, design or, or uh, optimize uh, the models. Um, mainly when uh, I'm talking specifically about Spanish because it's a complex language and sometimes uh, it is not well treated now today. Uh, all in all, you can find certain little mistakes. Okay, good, fine. Thanks a lot, Alexandra. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you want to just probably just add something? Uh, I can add that, uh, yes, uh, among the trends um, for alpha estimation, uh, we are seeing companies switching from simpler models like linear regression or tree-based models that are, are typically not flexible enough or easy to overfit uh, to some more complex probabilistic models, uh, as uh, Stuart had mentioned, um, that typically rely on uh, neural networks with uh, a few layers and uh, MCMC Markov chain Monte Carlo is a, an example that runs really fast on the IPU. And then for trade execution, also reinforcement mm. learning has been shown right. to produce better results uh, compared to classic methods like um, TWAP. Okay, thanks a lot. And, and one, one of the goal of this panel is just, uh, is just to touch one point because we have all those different type of um, models that exist uh, and the goal of this panel is just to discuss about the need of customizing everything. But before we jump to that is for a lot of different people today, the approach of using machine learning or AI is to leverage some kind of mainstream platform like we can discuss about data robot or other is why do you see that those platforms are not enough if we are discussing about customiz uh, custom um, uh, deep customization of those models? Just, what is your view on those platforms versus the need of having just something just much more specialized? Well, uh, first, allow me to uh, stress that uh, the GIS transforming data into bigger insights. And data, uh, as, as Simon, I think, mentions before, is uh, today's commodity. And um, perhaps that uh, we might agree that maximizing the hidden potential is a challenge and ensuring uh, into the existing views and workflows is easier said than done. As for the platform, uh, given an, the example of uh, that robot or any other, uh, it has and still has so much impact and recognition in the community. And we might think that if it is still in the market, surely it has some added value for its customers still. Uh, the truth is that uh, there is an increasing uh, need for reliable data and solutions to create your own customized models, which provides customers with confidence. Uh, but on all, only that, uh, let me uh, say that as data science as deeply matures, more profiles uh, come into play, and it is well known that the role of the data science has a great value. And, and now a, a new figure that I, I quote, um, coin myself is the meta one with a more holistic view, which uh, is contributing with expertise at every stage of the uh, workflow. And going deeper in, in my meetings uh, that we had with managers from different institutions, many agree that having uh, good developers and researchers and data scientists in their teams to design their own solution gives a higher added value than using the third uh, party platforms. Um, but of course, this is another approach. And, and as for me and, and our company, we're always in favor of guiding an institution to develop their own property and unique tools to achieve good differentials and, and eventually um, obtain some gains, which is uh, the purpose, the main purpose uh, behind using a and, and, and thanks a lot for that. Is that just Simon Stewart just on your side uh, or Alex? Is that, how do you just, what was your approach? That is, 
when you started just to customize some model versus using just kind of ready-made options that might be already available on the market? Why, why do you take this step? Sure. Well, well I did want to add one comment about the, the platform question, and that is, I think platforms like DataRobot or Amazon has SageMaker, um, they can be very powerful accelerators of productivity, but in addition to platforms, it's also important to have the right processes and the right people. So an analogy that I like to use with my team and colleagues and, and business partners is, you can provide a tool to anyone, right? You can provide a scalpel to someone, but that doesn't make them a surgeon. They can do a lot of damage, um, but think they know what they're doing. So um, just wanted to kind of throw that out there. I don't know, Stuart, if you had any comments about the platform question as well. Well, yeah, re related to that, I, I see a lot of our customers that do use a variety of different platforms. Um, and some of, the, some of the challenges they have is they're great platforms because they do democratize data science, right? And they make it very easy for anybody to start up and start learning how to use these tools and become a, a, a new data scientist. The challenge is, is that um, with any new tool, you use it as a crutch too often. And many of the new data scientists or the new quants that are using the platform, they'll, they'll create a model. It's got a great foot, a great uh, you know performance metric or error handling or error metric in and out of sample, but they can't really justify to management why they should trust that model or use it because they don't understand kind of the dynamics or kind of the limitations of these models. And that I think is the the danger of kind of automated machine learning and these automation platforms is they make it very easy, but sometimes we don't really understand why we're applying something. And we just rely on error metrics as, as kind of the gold standard rather than does it make sound business judgment to use it. The other part related to that is, um, I think Alejandro hit on too, was you really need to have domain experts involved with the data science teams. Because we've also had challenges just with data scientists who are great statisticians, great modelers, but they don't know the finance domain. They don't know what it really takes to create a good model or what the business objectives are that are driving that. So when you put the, you know, the domain expert with somebody who really knows how to model, that combination actually provides a lot of value because now you've got kind of both infused where the other one, the, the, the former quant or the quant might have all the expert knowledge and their domain experience, but may not know how to apply their greatest machine learning technique. And together, I think they can, can add a lot of value. And, and, but that's great, Josette, but I will play the devil advocate here. That is um, for sure that understanding better better understanding of your model better understanding of your data and customizing something that for sure you might get something that work better but now I just machine learning is already just as you mentioned simon is uh, kind of restricted to a small group of experts today if you start to tune your models how do you ensure that you can maintain it how do you ensure that you are not the only one that have tuned it and after that just uh, if you're not here tomorrow do that how do you ensure that other people understand what is this kind of now customization of machine learning that is an expert of experts? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And again, as I mentioned before, when I started out uh, working at Fidelity, I was an engineer. So I kind of have ingrained in my mindset, you know, reuse, try to, try to build things in a component architecture, microservices, et cetera. And I still come to, to problems with that mindset. But um, the reality is that this, you know, this is not Lord of the Rings. This is not one AI model to rule them all. Uh, models by their very nature are sensitive to the data that's used to train them. So while there are opportunities to leverage either utility functions, utility models, um, some features sometimes, um, you wanna take care and guard against underfitting or overfitting right. based on data. So if you develop or if you build a model, um, trying to apply that model in you know, dozens of different use cases for the largely you're going to fail because there's going to be something that it wasn't intended to do. Um, you need to know which features are important, which contain signal, which aren't, uh, and even more dangerous, which ones uh, can be destructive. So a lot of times, again, because the models are trained on specific data, it's, it's kind of specific to the use case. Now, I do understand that, again, companies like Amazon, they have this notion of feature stores, which are powerful, but again, just be careful because for a particular problem when you're developing a model, the data that you ultimately insert into a Python data frame, it might have different granularities, it might have different normalization factors, different assumptions baked in. Thanks a lot for that. Alex, from your own experience in terms of customization, the customization of some models, do you have any advice for all the different people that are listening to that in terms of how do you make sure that you have something that is maintainable uh, and that you can monitor properly? So um, 
we are seeing that uh, the companies uh, in this domain typically use uh, very custom models. And uh, it's uh, rare when something off the shelf is used and is able to deliver an advantage here. Um, and there, are, there is a set of techniques that uh, people use to uh, make sure that the model continues to perform adequately. Um, I am not on uh, that side of things, so I would not be able to share a lot here. Maybe other participants will. Okay, Alex, you are just on your side from your own experience. Well, I, I've seen um, I've seen kind of a mix of people trying to throw one big machine learning model at a problem and use a monolithic model that way. Uh, some of the ones I've seen to be more successful actually take a different approach and kind of a system of systems approach where they have many different machine models with specific purposes, kind of all working together with the data um, that they might be doing a lot of different data manipulation and feature engineering on. And I think a good example that everybody can kind of understand is, you know, if you look at Amazon and they're pricing their products in the marketplace today, you know, we've had customers that are actually building similar pricing systems, but what they're doing is they're building a competitive index. So they'll have a machine learning algorithm that'll mine the competitive information out there and kind of build like what would a, a competitor do in my situation, given my products parameters and capabilities. That's kind of a competitive thing that's actually fed into their actual like economic pricing um, systems, which are a component of several other machine learning models that look at elasticities and other things and come up with the best pricing given the competitive environment they have. Because, you know, they, they found that, um, you know, price elasticity was very sensitive when there's highly competitive commoditized offerings, you know, when there's great substitution. And th in those areas, they couldn't price for a premium, so they had to be competitive. And, machine, and the machine learning system, as they built it, actually helped them be very competitive. And, and that works very well in like retail situations, like loan pricing and things like that. So, you know, in terms of building, building custom models, I think it's building custom models, but also the entire pipeline around it. It's the data processing that goes into it, what features you're using. A lot of those could be actually engineered from other data sets, um, filtered. Some of them can cause issues if they go down. So just understanding the whole process and not just the model itself is kind of key to really being able to build a system that does what your business objective really and, is trying and do to you achieve. Have, so, sorry to interrupt, but do you have some special, again, technique to, for example, to test your customization? Is it something that you take in account that how do you just ensure that your customization is doing what needs to be done? Well, in many cases, they actually end up building the model and find out that they need to run experiments or get additional data, or they'll find that the data they have just is incomplete. Um, so through the process of building a model, a lot of the, the, the driving the customization of the model comes from their business processes, the data they have and understanding that. And if they start out and they don't have a good set of data with the details that they really need, they'll have a course model. And then as they go back to the business, they might be collecting transactions data or pricing data from elsewhere or competitive information. They then enrich their data set with more information that then I can take advantage of. So then they'll evolve the model to kind of take that information into account. So it's kind of, you can always think of it as, as more of a continuous evolution. Um, nothing usually starts out as one model and then you're off. It's, it's the continuously refine and tweak and make it better and better. And that's the whole process I think that, um, you know, behind this, it really needs to be, be there is, you know, bring in your domain experts, bring in your data engineers, bring in your system architects that can help you scale these things. Um, all of that really goes to what's the business objective of the modeling outcome. Like, what are you trying to use with that? Is it a real-time pricing system or a batch batch processing risk scoring system? Yeah. Thank you. And just uh, on your side, Alexander, I presume that customization, especially for the products you were mentioning in NLP before, that is something that happen all the time uh, just by the language or by the different techniques that and the the type of text that you have to go through and so what what is your view on this kind of customization and how do you ensure that you have something that you can maintain and it's not just kind of uh, every time you have to just kind of replicate it from scratch every time you want to change a model for application uh, applying it to something else Alexandra? It's for me. Yeah. I'm sorry. It was like just well then. Um, what I reference to is um, that uh, I'm probably mentioned it before is that um, 
companies are not interested in general in, in, in things that they do not understand. I make a reference to that. So uh, um, the black boxes do not work anymore. So uh, on the other hand, um, the model, uh, uh, for instance, if you run the same model uh, many times and you do not work on it, uh, let's say taking care of the uh, data that you are incorporating or updating uh, alternative data or taking into consideration the condition instance in, in, in a, a marketplace that is uh, volatility is taking place, for example, in, the, in this uh, current environment that is a pandemia. Um, so the model doesn't work in, anymore because the volatility uh, changes the, 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 the output of the model. If you are not very careful uh, in um, training the model correctly, adding the, uh, the for example, the dri market drivers, um, I'm working on that. Sometimes they may exert certain influence in some, some contexts and in some others they are irrelevant. So uh, it is important to um, fine tune the model, uh, double check, test the model, uh, retrain uh, the model uh, to see is the best option uh, that works for a specific condition, for a specific um, um, let's say sector in, 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 in finance, for instance, or, or maybe in, in medicine, in genetics, in some other areas. So each model depends and customization depends on the demands from the, 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 the customers and what the customer has as data sets and, and some other information that you may gather from the context. Okay, thank, thanks a lot. And, and perhaps just, um, on this customization side, just Simon, just one, one aspect, and just you for for everyone as well. But um, finance become more and more regulated. So already that when we go, when we start to talk about machine learning AI, it is I would not say safe. Just say, oh, my my model is a standard one because already just kind of a black box. Yes, Alexandra was mentioning that nobody wants to have a black box, but if you have a black box that is already used by everyone, you are kind of a uh, bit more uh, safe, I will say, just from a regulation point of view, perhaps, not sure from an investment point of view. So, but when you go from a customized models, how do you deal with that when you look at your investor, when you look at people that uh, want just to understand what you are doing, just how do you apply? Do, do you follow a specific process? Simon, is that on your side or? Sure, yeah, I can take a swing at that. Um, Generally speaking, and this isn't always the case, but generally speaking, the simpler the model, the more interpretable or explainable it is. The more sophisticated the model, the more black boxy it is, right? So you go from simple, from logistic regression, um, all the way to your complex, you know, neural networks on the sophisticated side. Um, somewhere in between, you know, we have, uh, I think Stuart was one that mentioned like random forest trees. Those are, are very nice. They're in our experience, some of the best performers, and they're also easy to explain, right? Um, I mean, Alejandra had mentioned before that people these days don't like black box models anymore. And I'll kind of take that a step further. Benoit, you mentioned not only do people not like it, it's becoming no longer legal. Think about GDPR in Europe, that's coming to the United States as well, right? So um, we're, we're basically being told that we must have transparency in our models. And the way to do that really is either the direct approach, which is sometimes you might have to sacrifice some performance in favor of explainability, um, or if there are sort of ways of proxying the um, sort of explainability of a model and ways you can go about that are perhaps you do have a sophisticated neural net for instance, um, but what you can do is you can actually create a, another model on top of an instance of that that is more explainable. And then you kind of have a, a substitute for the, um, the actual underpinnings of, of the more complex model. Um, but yeah, it's, it's something that we're gonna have to deal with increasingly as time goes on and regulations become stricter. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, we'll move to the Q&A and just, uh, guys, as you see that uh, we received just a few questions from, uh, from the audience. Uh, perhaps the first one will be perhaps for you, just Alexandra. 
Um, and when we discuss about uh, the BERT model, um, uh, one question from Timothy is, have there been any issues related to the model size latency that serve as a bottleneck to our adoptions? Well, the, 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 as I said, the truth is that, well, the, the, um, there are some limitations to the model. And um, of course, I mean, still there are certain um, tasks that can be well solved for the model, um, such as, for example, can, can it be used for, for, for a child? Yes. I mean, uh, but and, and can it be utilized for, for more conventional AI applications? Certainly. But still, like I said, there are certain issues when you are trying to apply it. And so you, you have to go uh, deeper and, 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 and see um, where are the, 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 the keys uh, to follow when you are implementing this uh, type of, of technique model, such as uh, BERT. Um, um, I don't know if I'm, I'm answering the question or, or, or if, because it's too long and I'm trying to be very uh, short and simplify the answer. I don't want to run into technicalities now. <laughs> Timothy, if you hear us, if you want to uh, re-ask a, a detail, just feel free just to, uh, to pop a question as well. Um, so we have, a, we have another question. This one is very uh, wide, I will think. Uh, but if from your experience, uh, from uh, Volodymyr that has, is asking, what kind of data do you think are the most important to be modeled input arguments? So well, I think I think I would go back and rephrase the question to be, what is the what is the outcome you're trying to achieve with the model, which would dictate mm -hmm. the types of data. Um, a lot of times you start with a data you might have your internal databases or whatever data you can acquire, but then in the process of building that model and trying to answer the business question, you often find that data sets insufficient and you need to expand it somehow, either enriching it, um, add different things to it. Or maybe even you might need to set up an experiment and run the experiment to, to gather data from wherever you're sourcing it. So it's the, the data that goes in, you know, there are many tools that you can use to do like feature importance and feature screening and even things that might um, be subject to GDPR, like is, is this biased data, uh, gender specific data that you don't want to, you want to exclude. A lot of tools to help you kind of screen data from that perspective. But again, I think you need to go back and ask what's the What's the underlying business question you're trying to answer and then look for the data sources that enrich in your understanding or the machine learning algorithms capability to understand that, that market as well. Simon, Alex, anything to add on this one? I think Stuart hit the nail on the head there. The, the answer to that question is gonna change with every single use case. That's like 90% of the fun of, of being a data scientist, right? Trying to figure out what features are important to answer this question. So does that one, right. uh, let's go to a more technical one in this case from uh, Pierre uh, asking, do you ever look into uh, causal reasoning? Uh, Who want to jump on this one? Stuart, you, you, uh, you are nodding. Sure, so I think, I think causal reasoning in many areas is a newer concept for most. Um, so I don't know if a lot of people are understanding that, but that's true, really, really trying to use neural networks and other techniques to understand the causal relationship between the inputs and outputs and not just correlation and, and covariance and, and um, co-integration, right? And so I think, I think that's a new emerging field and a lot of techniques that help drive that are um, interesting to pursue. Uh, I'm excited about the, the area itself, but I haven't really seen you know, widespread adoption of using causal techniques because determining causality of the data you have is actually very challenging um, proposition because you may not actually have the, the underlying causal variables. They might be latent in the data or they might be hidden from you. So being able to determine that is, is it's a pretty advanced kind of maneuver. But I think it's kind of interesting where we can now use machine learning techniques to look at data. Um, much like you use machine learning to do classification or clustering, you can now start to use that to look at, well, what can I, what can I pull out of this as causal techniques or causal relationships between them? 
Um, I don't have a lot of experience in that yet, but I've seen some of the papers that, that are out there and I think it's very exciting, but that's kind of my viewpoint from the little limited exposure I have currently. Okay, thank you. Uh, Taran, you want to just add anything to us? See you yeah, I mean, I'll just sort of pile on a little bit. I, I agree 100% with Stuart again. Um, <laughs> I think that AI and machine learning can be very good at detecting patterns and determining correlation. Um, however, at this current state, AI and ML alone are not sufficient for determining causality. And so generally what you want to do is you want to pair AI and ML techniques with your good old scientific method, right? So run an experiment, A-B testing, et cetera. Now that might be uh, more feasible in certain contexts and less feasible in others. So if you have access to a huge sample population that are, you know, roughly you can get um, representative samples across you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of people, for instance, and they're, they're uh, well representative, so not biased, then you can start doing these experiments using AI or not and determining, okay, if I do this or not, it's gonna uh, yield this outcome. Um, but you also might be in a situation where the problem has a much smaller uh, impact radius, in which case it's really not feasible to conduct those types of experiments. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, one new question. Uh, we have a few more questions that are uh, deeper and deeper every time. Uh, this one is uh, it's not easy as well to answer. A uh, question from Sesta, Andre. Uh, how do you balance truth with perception, value with price, fundamental with behavior? How do you balance that with the models? Who want to jump on this one? I, I'll, I'll bite. Um, so I, I kind of think the question is really getting at trustworthy or reliable AI in, in many senses. Like, how do you trust that what we're doing is actually producing good results? And, you know, I think it's a good question of any modeler to ask those questions. But I think with AI, because they are black box and because you often get asked those questions of your management team, this is why are you using this? Why do you trust it? Um, how do you know it's not going to get us into hot water under certain scenarios? It's, um, you know, with a, with an explainable model, you know immediately kind of the failure modes that it might have. With a black box, you don't. So it comes back to looking at how do you how do you test the model for different types of failure modes? How do you test it for coverage? And I think there's a lot of new emphasis in a lot of areas now for for testing for AI trustworthy and reliability and robustness. Like an example is, um, you know, if you think of software, there's often a unit test which tests one singular function for for a certain capability or input output relationship. There are now starting to be like neuron coverage tests that are out there. So they'll actually, you know, explore the space of inputs that your neural network can take and then actually measure all the neurons and see when they're activated or not. And when you run your test, you can get a feel for how much of the neural network that you've built did you actually test, you know, how much of it did actually get activated or not. So it gives you a sense of is your test suite expansive enough that you're you're kind of exploring the entire space that would be stretching your neural network model. Others are looking more at the data and like, um, you know, pulling different parameters in and out and seeing how that does. So I think of it as a way as, you know, it's really going back to scientific principles and treating your model as kind of an experiment or your, your, your black box is an experiment and experimenting with it, see how it fell, throwing at different scenarios. And really that comes back to good test design and thinking about how am I gonna design tests that, that tell me when this will fail or when will it succeed and did I expect it to behave that way? And, and, and thanks a lot for that, but I will think that as well, just uh, Alexandra, just that um, in the NLP domain, this is one of the key issues sometimes because of that a text in different language will mean different things uh, based on the different set of uh, the different world will mean different things in different language. So how do you just test your model? How do you just ensure that your model is correct every time that you have some special testing techniques that you apply on your side? Well, uh, I mean, uh, first uh, you have to run the experiment and, and um, one of the key variables are the uh, environments and a good knowledge of the uh, linguistic features that you are going to uh, incorporate in the model. Because for instance, markers, text markers, uh, in different languages, they are, I, I mean, they are not the same. So you have to look specifically at uh, your data set, your training set, and see 
the main characteristics that you want to add and then uh, test, um, run a test to see if your uh, hypotheses are, I mean, okay. But uh, in, in natural language processing, and, and I'm just giving you an example, for instance, when you are uh, working with earning conference call, you, you may uh, try to figure out the attitudes of the uh, management, uh, what are the market drivers, what are the, if they are, for instance, work, uh, working in an, an environment that is uh, volatility is one of the primary factors that you are going to consider. So you need to um, add those key ingredients uh, to your data set when you are uh, just uh, the model. Because other than that, and in different language, it were, it might work different. You may have a generic model. I'm not saying that you are not going to have it, but it, it is um, advisable to have your specific for each language it is specific. And sometimes a, I know that it takes a lot of time uh, because it took me like <laughs> seven years for me to uh, create my own uh, lexicon in Spanish for Argentinian Spanish, which is a different uh, uh, variety from the Spanish from Spain, from uh, Portugal, from, from, from uh, uh, Brazil, well, Brazil is Portuguese, but anyway, from Spain, from Mexico, from Chile. And so you have ver very different uh, variables to, to take into consideration. The model won't work in that case. Great, thanks, thanks a lot. And so we have three more minutes and just, I see just um, one more question as well. Uh, so from Radu uh, asking, um, Related to anything done in including uh, quantitative behavior finance and crowd, crowd um, psychology in AI and ML models in investment trading. So do you, do you use any AI or ML models in investments that is linked to quantitative behavior finance and crowd psychology? Well, uh, in, in our particular case, since the disciplinary team, of course, we work not only without those fields, we include uh, different uh, parameters to our framework, our model, but also we work with anthropologists, for instance, so, uh, or, or social scientists, uh, mainly when you are uh, uh, trying to get uh, more information available, uh, alternative data from Twitter or from Facebook or from different uh, um, social media. So you need, I mean, I, I think it's, it's, it's a must to have this uh, quantitative behavioral finance behind us in the framework. I mean, you have to do that if you are going to work. For instance, in, in LLP and, in, and, 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 and models in investment trading framework, for instance, the uh, Thirty percent of the model is NLP, and we consider all these variables. You cannot separate them from the model because behind the decision there is always a behavior. So you cannot put them separate. You have to incorporate to uh, the model. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, so we just ran just out of time in just in one minute. So. Uh, Guys, just questions are still coming up. So that's unfortunately, I'm sorry just for, for the attendee. If we, if we didn't uh, ask a question, uh, feel free just to reach out. Uh, I presume just that guys will be uh, all happy just to, to have questions just if people want to reach out to, to you directly. Um, so thanks a lot for everyone. If you have Simon, Alex, Stuart, Alexandra, do you have any last advice, comments, or just uh, kind of uh, other type of uh, ideas that you want to share with this panel today? I have quite a bit, but what I don't have is time. So thank you very much. <laughs> I think that's the same, same boat for me too. It's a, it's a pleasure yes. um, serving on the panel and, and meeting everybody here, but also everybody that attended, you know, and the follow-up conversations afterward, I think are the great part of these things. Oh, thank you so much for, for having me here and share the, this, this panel with these outstanding uh, colleagues. I've learned a lot. Um, and so I hope the audience learns a lot and, and enjoy the panel as well. Thank you very much. Thank you all. And thanks for all the participants. <laughs>